Well, this is the podcast for Multi-Faith Matters, and I am the host, John Moorhead. And today I am privileged to have as a guest on the po- uh, podcast, Kalpana Jane. And I think I pronounced that correctly. Can you help me there? She's shaking her that, head. Yes. Okay. That's absolutely right. Thank you, John. <laughs> uh, I have a little bio here and folks can look in the program notes uh, for and click on the link for more extensive bio at our website and see uh, further examples of her work. She is a longtime investigative journalist who worked at the Times of India for many years. She reported on India's ailing public health system and many other social justice issues. Her reports led to the resignation of a minister for health. She studied gender and religion and holds a master's in theological studies from Harvard Divinity School and a master's in public administration from the Harvard Kennedy School. She has worked as a writer and researcher at Harvard. Her case study on modern day slavery in India and a woman's fight against it is part of a Harvard course and her her book on the AIDS epidemic in India published by Penguin is part of the curriculum at many Indian universities. And today she's gonna be uh, discussing uh, Jainism. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, John. Uh, as I mentioned before we started recording, I came across uh, something that you wrote. You you write a lot of things. I enjoy your writing, and you had published an article at Religion News Service titled "Burning Karma: The Jain's Late Summer Holy Season Focuses on Purifying the Soul." And you mentioned in there um, that in America you run into a lot of people, and you have to do a lot of explaining about what Jainism is all about. And so we're glad to have you here to do that because uh, I know it's one of those uh, traditions that I I probably know the least of, uh, which is saying something because I study a lot of more obscure kinds of religious traditions. Uh, But let's begin on a a personal note. Can you share a little bit about your background? Were you raised in Jainism? Yes, I was raised in Jainism. It's a very ancient religion in India. Um, some would say, you know, older than what you see today's practice of Hinduism, because Hinduism also goes back to the Vedic tradition, which is thousands of years old. So Jainism and Buddhism are two very ancient uh, religions of India. And over a period of time, the number of Jains dwindled, um, not as much in India, but in the US, of course. I mean, in India also, I would say they're a minority. though many would just see them as part of, you know, I mean, a lot of the, it's, let me say, there's a lot of religious fluidity also in India. So the Jains would also join with Hinduism. They don't see many things are not practiced separately. Um, so it's, it's, in India, it's an interesting sort of a mix of how it's practiced, but Yes, you're right. When I moved to the United States, it's like people didn't know who the Jains were. People do know the Buddhists, but they don't know the Jains. Now, what what are the origins of Jainism? You mentioned that it, it uh, it's older than than Hinduism, and it, if I heard you correctly, you say it should not be understood as part of the Vedic tradition. So, what are its origins, and and what family of religion would we You know how scholars kind of look at different religious streams, where where would we place that? So this is an ascetic faith. Um, Both Buddhism and Jainism are believed to be ascetic ascetic faiths. Um, The origins really go back, as the Jains believe, thousands and thousands of years ago with the first um, who are called Tirithankaras. Now, these are really different from prophets, but one way to understand maybe for a Western audience is to understand them as prophets. So it was Rishabdeva, was the first Tirithankara. That really means that he was, he's worshipped. It's, it's, it's very complex because I can't say he's God, but then Jains would still worship him as the first Tirithankara or Ford maker who crossed into being, um, attaining Nirvana. Uh, that is liberation from the cycle of birth and deaths, which um, you would probably know, um, you know, in, in Hindu belief and in Jain beliefs, the belief is that life continues even after death, the soul takes multiple births, rebirths. And the idea is to, at some point of time, liberate yourself from this cycle of birth and le- rebirth. And that's what's considered um, what in Christian terminology um, would be called salvation. Okay. Um, what would be some of its uh, primary practices and beliefs would it would it be oriented more you know as you know um christianity particularly in the west and the protestant tradition is more oriented around belief 
a lot of religions are, they're more oriented around practice. How does that work in Jainism? So let me first uh, complete my thought on uh, the origins. And, okay. uh, it, you know, so first was Rishabdeva, who was the first okay. Tirithankar. And then there were 24 others. Um, now there is no, scholars won't have a historical um, a record of um, 23 Tirithankaras, but the last Tirithankara was Mahavira, who was a contemporary of Buddha. It's believed that they lived around the same time, um, probably never met, but the teachings were very similar in many ways. Um, the Jainism was, um, the practice was way more difficult, at least that's what is said today. And um, Buddhism grew very widely, um, especially, you know, um, outside of the Indian subcontinent, uh, whereas Jainism remained within India, it didn't grow as much outside. So coming back to um, beliefs, the biggest belief, at least the way I practice it, and I've seen my mother practice or my family practice is, is through our kitchen, I would say. Um, the biggest belief is nonviolence, do no harm. Um, and the way it's considered ahimsa, you know, Gandhi, Gandhi really learned from the Jains. Um, his mother was a practitioner of Jainism. And when people ask me, who are the Jains? Then I say, well, Gandhi learned from the Jains and that's where he got his, uh, you know, practice of nonviolence or ahimsa from. And that is really what motivates Jains, I think, in their day-to-day -day, um, life, beliefs, cooking, and the idea is that um, you practice ahimsa. Now, the practice of ahimsa is, as I, as I understand from my own practice, very difficult because mm. you end up hurting people. Um, and, you know, the goal is that you, you cause no harm. You don't want to hurt. You don't want to lie. So it's, it's an extreme practice in that way. And also the idea is that um, eating, um, just consuming food by itself is an act of violence in a way. Um, you are eating, uh, even if it's plants, you are eating them. So just consuming, consuming them is an act of violence. So how do you reduce that violence? You can't stop eating, but how do you reduce that violence? So in Jainism, um, the bigger animals, of course, are sentient beings, uh, living beings, but even the plants, and lower forms are considered to be sentient beings. So the practice then is, how do you become more considerate towards those sentient beings? And you don't take more than what you need. And how can you reduce that harm that you're causing? So for my mother, for instance, and I haven't given it up, I, my mother gave up eating potatoes. Now, why potatoes? Because that's where the food of the plant is stored. So you don't want to take away the root, the food of the plant. So she switched to other foods, but that was like her practice as you know, she got older, she brought in various other practices as part of this belief. She wouldn't eat after dark. And that is because um, the, the fear or the belief is that as um, you know, later in the evening, there may be more invisible organisms that might enter your mouth, your food, so you don't want to do that. So that's the kind of practice where, the, where you're recognizing that you're sharing this earth with a lot of, lot of other beings and organisms. Some you can see and some you can't see, or some are just too minute that might be crushed under your feet. So you want to be careful about that. You just want to recognize that you share this earth with others and you don't want to cause harm. So that's the practice. I okay. hope I managed to explain that. Yes, yes. Uh, are there temples associated with it? Are, is it home uh, altars? How, how does that play out? Yes, there are temples associated with it. So I talked about the 24 Tirithankaras. Now those, are, are, you know, the word gods in Hinduism is slightly different because gods are considered active. So if you see any Hindu temple or Hindu icons or deities, they are sort of in poses where they show them, you know, with their hands, you know, in, in a sort of a movement. Whereas the Jain Tirithankaras are in a meditative pose. It is believed that they've 
gone into a universe where they live as completely pure spirits and they cannot be accessed. So they're not listening to your prayers. So you go and pray to them so you can aspire to be like them, to have their you know, very, very highly refined qualities of what it means to, you know, for that kind of extreme asceticism and penance and what it takes to be that. So yes, there are temples, there are beautiful Jain temples and very ancient Jain temples all over India. Um, one unique feature of Jain temples is, um, other than the deities, um, they're very, very peaceful places, the Jain temples. I love going there. And one very unique feature from very ancient architecture is the ceilings. They're so ornate and they're so beautiful. Um, so I, you know, I travel when I travel around, I like to go into ancient Jain temples also as a way to admire the architecture. Um, Ajanta and Ellora is another place in India. Um, you know, these are ancient caves where the first temple architecture started in uh, central India. And I've been there and that's where some of the earliest Jain cave temples are situated. So the earliest architecture that you see of Jain temples. And then yes, they are all over India um, and they are here in the United States too. Mm. Well, where might uh, some temples, Jain temples be so that folks can have an idea? Um, well, I, I live in Massachusetts uh, mm -hmm. in Boston and the closest temple near my place is in Norwood. Um, but there are others. I know there is one in Las Vegas. Mm. And it's very interesting that, you know, for the diaspora, the Indian community, the differences that might exist in India kind of go away when they're here. It's one big diaspora. So there are temples which are both Hindu and Jain temples combined. Mm. Um, so you'll find the Hindu deities as well as the Jain deities in, in one temple, which would be unheard of in India. And the other is that even within Jainism, there are two sects, the Digambaras and the Shwetambaras. The difference being that in the Digambara sect, um, the monks, um, they do not wear any clothes. And that's an extreme form of penance, whether it be, you know, it's extreme cold, it's extreme heat, because they've given up any attachment to the world. And these are male monks, by the way, women do. Um, whereas Shritambaras have a different theology and they wear white. Um, now in India, you won't find, um, the deities are slightly um, modified, um, though they're still in meditative pose. But you know, if I were to walk into a temple, I'll be able to identify and say, this is a Shritambara. Uh, worship style, Shwetambara uh, style of, uh, uh, you know, um, a deity. So, um, but in the United States, I go to, when I go to the Jain temple, all the deities are all in one place, uh, which is very interesting how any kind of differences between sects just go away when you're here as, a, as one diaspora. So I probably told you more than you asked. No, 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 this is great. <laughs> How does, you mentioned a little bit of it at the beginning that it's a, it's a small part of uh, India's religious population. How, how does it relate size-wise to other religious traditions in India and in the United States? Yeah, it, I mean, um, I don't know the exact numbers, but the last I knew it was like 0.2% of the entire population. So it, it, is, it is a tiny minority. Um, I would say um, because Jains as a tradition, they did not want to go into, let's say, agriculture where they would uh, end up hurting other beings. So a lot of Jains traditionally went into businesses. So they do control a lot of the wealth. They're wealthy businessmen. You know, Times of India itself is run by a Jain family. Um, and even in the United States, um, it's a very tiny diaspora. I, I don't know the numbers. Okay. Did, do there tend to be like, for example, the, the Sikh community? I know there's a large population in Northern California. Are there certain areas of the United States where there's a larger concentration of the Jain community? Um, I can't say. I think okay. that they're, they're kind of distributed all over. Okay. Yeah. I talk to people from, um, 
there is there is a small Jain community in Las Vegas. There is a Jain community in Boston. So they are, they distribute it mm-hmm. around. Okay, I, I know there have been some tensions uh, in India, for example, between Hindus and Muslims. Uh, are there have there been any tensions in India uh, between Jains and other religious populations? No, um, I mean. I have to clarify here that the tensions, um, it's like, that's a whole another, that's a political thing, you know, when Mm. religions become political and there's Mm -hmm. Hindu nationalism, but for that matter, no, not between Jains and other communities, but then Jains can see themselves as part of the Hindu community. It's helpful to know. How does a, a Jain experience in America, how might that differ from that in India? Um, I think what I mentioned, the biggest difference is the temples. Just the temples. Uh, yeah. Um, I, just practicing it is very hard. Uh, you know, um, it's not one, it's not easy to go to a temple right. because it's not like there is a temple in your neighborhood, which is what you would have in India. There would be a Jain temple somewhere in your neighborhood and you could go there every morning if you wanted to. Um, you don't have the same kind of, um, you know, access to doing what we call the puja. That is, you know, you do it yourself, but really having access to all the things that you need to do the puja. So you really can't practice it in the way you would do it in India. There are limitations, a lot of limitations to it. I know some Jains who go every weekend to the temple, but uh, I would find that hard. you know, walking to your temple, which is what you could do in India, is a whole different thing than, you know, driving to Norwood on a weekend. Um, yeah, so it's just hard. And um, then the difference in the temple, as I mentioned, um, which is actually quite nice, you know, to see that uh, there are no sectarian divisions here in the United States. And the temples don't look as beautiful as they do in India because <laughs> they're very ancient temples in India. And here, very interestingly, I think one of the temples I visited was an earlier church structure, which was then um, converted later. Mm. Uh, and which is how, you know, sort of religious places change. It's not uncommon, as you know, for uh, a population when it, it comes and tries to find an established new life in another country to experience struggles would you, what are some of the struggles, if there are any, for, for Jains? Would you say it's the, the lack of awareness that many people have of what Jainism is all about, or are there other struggles? No, I, I mean, unlike the Sikh community, the, who you might know, you know, because of um, their turban or beard can get mistaken mm-hmm. um, and often called terrorists or, you know, can get mistaken um, whether you know, in a way that hurts them. With the Jains, it's not like that. Um, There are the usual struggles of moving to another land. Um, I'm not that much of a religious person, you know, I practice. And that's also sort of, you know, a way of Jainism that you can just practice your religion from your home. So I can have my altar in my home when I, you know, as I said, I practice it from my kitchen. So I didn't find any struggles associated with my faith of moving here. Um, People may not know about Jainism, but um, that hardly seems to matter. You know, today the world is very different. I think when I traveled 20 years ago, just trying to find vegetarian food was very hard. People had no concept about what was vegetarian. But today the world's, you know, just sort of moved in a very interesting way. There is more and more demand for plant-based food. So you can find food everywhere. And I think that's kind of the biggest challenge for Jains um, and who are mostly vegetarians is to find their food and that you can find. Mm -hmm. Uh, You you mentioned that there, uh, you know, people are familiar with, and you mentioned this in your article, and we've touched on a little bit here about how people are familiar with these other religious traditions. Do you think it's just the, the size? Uh, if, do you think if there were more Jains in the United States and maybe in India that it would have p- greater familiarity? Maybe. I also think, I mean, given that I went 
to um, theological school, I also found that in American universities, there is not really much teaching of the Jain religion. Mm. It's starting to change now, and the Jain diaspora is making that happen. I think they've set up kind of courses very recently across the United States, um, giving, providing funding, setting up chairs, and trying to bring um, the teaching of Jain religion into American ed higher education. But that might have been one of the limitations that there just wasn't anything. Whereas when you go into uh, American universities, there's a lot of teaching and classes and scholarship going on Buddhism. I, I, uh, when I read your bio uh, at the beginning, and folks can see the extended bio when they click on the link, um, you've done a lot of work and a lot of writing. How does your Jane faith uh, impact the work that you do? That's an interesting question. I didn't think about it so far. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Did you know, you, when a, yeah. Do you feel like you consciously draw upon it or is it just a part of who you are and it, you know, you just do what you do? I suppose so. I just do what I do. Um, yeah, I don't know if I consciously draw upon it. I mean, mm -hmm. much of my um, grounding comes from, you know, just the core value of uh, ahimsa, do no harm. And all my work kind of goes into that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I consciously drop on that. I, I really have chosen a profession keeping, not that I was thinking about it then, but as I said earlier, the JN faith does say, don't choose a profession where you might have to hurt or kill something. So I guess if I had been a scientist who had to work on animals, that would have been hard for me. Mm -hmm. uh, but in writing, I don't think I'm hurting anybody or anything, but I'm trying to change things in my own right. way, in a non-violent way. Right. Um, yeah, so but, I yeah. guess maybe... Yeah, that, that's interesting. It just occurred to me. Um, and I guess it gets... I think one of the challenges you would face, and I think you mentioned this, is if you're trying to do no harm, I suppose it depends upon... There are a lot of ways you can define harm and, and violence. You, you, at times in your work, are challenging others uh, for what you see as injustices. Um, so is there room within your understanding of, of do no harm for someone may perceive harm and you're trying to correct an injustice, but it's, uh, it, you know, everyone's going to define harm differently. Somebody who might strongly disagree with you and be doing what you would consider an injustice, they would say you're harming them. How would right. that, yeah, how does that work? Yeah, I mean, I think on some definitions, we agree on what is social justice and where you're harming I, I'm not going into the debates on masks right. and all that stuff, but you can clearly see a social justice issue when it's there, when someone is getting hurt, who's disadvantaged, poor, or, mm -hmm. you know, in whatever way doesn't have the kind of power. And, you know, a more powerful force is exerting itself in an unjust way. That's how I define it. Mm -hmm. And that's how, um, that's the kind of work that I've done. And I've done a lot of work on gender and women and, you know, when it comes to public health, really access to people who can't get it. And the stories that I've covered, it's, you can clearly see that these are people who are really deprived. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there's an argument on that. Right. I don't think there'll be people who'll turn around and say, well, you're looking at justice the wrong way. If they right, do, right. well, then there's something wrong there. That's right. Uh, can you make a few suggestions of where people might go to learn more about Jainism? Anything come to mind? Um, well, there are scholarly books, for one. Um, can I send you some names later? I don't know. There is. Yeah, I can. I can yeah. Add, yeah, sure. We can include uh, uh, some links and further resources for folks who want to take a look at that. That would be great. Yes, because there are websites and there is a great scholarly book. Um, and I can, you know, correct the name later, but it's by. Um, uh, John Court, um, and he's written, you know, sort of a fascinating book, just explaining Jainism, and that would be good. Um, so, I yeah, I can send you links to a couple of works okay. and, uh, and websites. Fantastic. We will include that in the program notes as well, so folks can just use our conversation as just a very brief introduction to a fascinating and deep and rich religious tradition. So 
Uh, Kalpana Jain, I, I thank you so much for being on the program. Thank you so much. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk about this faith, which I it's actually, you know, is dear to my heart for what it teaches me in terms of values. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for uh, responding to somebody you didn't know who just saw an article of yours and, uh, <laughs> and wanted to have you on the program. So it's very much appreciated. Thank you. You have a great day. You too.